This is the 14th and final video for the ethics and legal considerations part of the animal chiropractic class. And in this video, I want to make a quick comment about what belongs in the records for veterinary care for animal chiropractic. Uh, generally for chiropractors, it's relatively rare for the state rules or regulations to spell out with much detail, if any detail, about what needs to be included in the records. But one thing I've noticed looking at the veterinary rules is that several states spell out very specifically what information must be in that veterinary medical record. Uh, pay attention to what's required. If you're a chiropractor working with animals, again, one way to show your competence and to build the trust with the veterinarian is to make sure you include all this information as appropriate. So some of it is uh, uh, pretty self, well, actually all of it's self-explanatory, but somewhere in your office as an animal chiropractor, you should keep a checklist of what information is required in the vet veterinary records and make sure you are providing that information. So for example, in Texas, you have to have the name and address of the client, patient's identity, patient's history, the dates of visits, immunization records, uh, the weight if it's required for diagnosis or treatment. Uh, of course, if it's difficult to obtain, for example, with a large animal, then the weight can be estimated. Uh, the temperature if required for diagnosis or treatment, any lab analysis, any x-rays, uh, and medications that are prescribed or administered or dispensed. Uh, other details necessary to substantiate the examination, diagnosis, and treatment. The signed acknowledgement. Now, we've talked about that several times already, but that signed acknowledgement that shows that the client is consenting to chiropractic care and has been told that chiropractic care is an alternative therapy to traditional veterinary medicine. Each entry should also identify the veterinarian. So even though the entry is created by the chiropractor or the animal chiropractor, the entry in the record should identify who the veterinarian is who supervised the procedure. Even though that supervision might have been that general supervision where the veterinarian was not there, uh, that should be part of the record. Yeah, I don't know if I've probably mentioned this before, but I'll mention it again. Uh, one of the ways to uh, build your reputation as a chiropractor is to keep good records, but to also share those records. Uh, I think it was Nevada, I believe, that required that the records be delivered to the supervising veterinarian within 48 hours. I think that's probably a good practice. Uh, after each visit to send a copy of the record uh, to the veterinarian providing supervision. Uh, that gives the veterinarian, it keeps them in the loop, and it also shows them that the animal chiropractor is doing exactly what they are supposed to be doing and gives the veterinarian a chance to intervene if there's a problem or there appears to be a problem with the treatment plan for the patient. So as a chiropractor, you want to keep these records carefully, thoroughly, completely, accurately, and honestly, and then share those records with the veterinarians who are uh, working with you on treating the patient to help demonstrate your, your skills as a uh, animal chiropractor. Uh, changing your records, we've already talked about the appropriate manner for changing records. If you make a mistake, you make a, a transparent change to your record so people can tell exactly what was changed and when the change was made. Uh, if you change the file after a claim is made, it causes you to lose credibility. This Kaplan case was kind of an interesting case. It's, it's a little bit old, but it's still a very interesting case. It was, of course, involved a paper file. This case actually went to a jury trial. And sometime after the jury trial, it was discovered that one of the forms used by the doctor was not printed 
until two years after the entries were created or supposedly created. So obviously in this case, the doctor had gone back and replaced a page of his daily notes uh, because he used a form that wasn't printed until later. It wound up being a fairly easy thing to catch. Now, the problem with making that kind of change is that once you are caught having made that change, you lose all credibility as a doctor. Even if the doctor provided good care, uh, once a jury hears about forgery of medical records, the jury is not going to be inclined to believe anything the doctor has to say. Now, losing the file is not a good result. Um, in some states, if the records are lost, it may create a, a presumption that the doctor was negligent. And that means the only issue for a jury to decide is essentially what the damages should be. So even if a file contains damaging information, even if a file was not kept very well, you're better off producing a, a poorly kept file than trying to hide it by saying you've lost the file. Uh, losing a critical part of the file can also cause uh, problems. Uh, sometimes doctors will find those key parts and they will get lost, uh, either intentionally or not. Now, there's a principle in law called spoliation of evidence. And it means if the person who had custody of the record failed to maintain it so that it was lost or destroyed, the court can enter sanctions against that person for failing to preserve the evidence. Uh, and that's what happened in this uh, Keene case. Uh, a key part of the file was lost. As a result, the court made a finding uh, to, to uh, uh, impose sanctions against the party that lost those records. So even though it may be tempting to change your records, and I'll, I'll guarantee you that you're not always going to be caught, but if you ever do get caught, you really leave yourself very few options uh, other than trying to settle the case. Because if you're forging medical records, nobody's going to believe anything else you have to say. So that's all the substantive material I have to cover. And in this last couple slides here is just something to think about. It's just advice from an old farmer. And of course, start with keep skunks, bankers, and lawyers at a distance. If you can get through life without dealing with lawyers, that's better. Uh, life is simpler when you plow around the stump. Look, whatever kind of practice you have, whatever kind of business you're in, whatever kind of family relationships you have, you're going to run into problems from time to time. Uh, and it's sometimes the best thing to do is to plow through those problems. But a lot of times the best thing to do is to plow around it and maybe come back and deal with that problem at a different time. Um, I like the last one on this slide. Remember that silence is sometimes the best answer. Sometimes the best thing you can do is to quit talking. I know as I watch court hearings, I frequently watch lawyers who are already in trouble make it worse and worse by continuing to talk. If they would just be quiet and let the judge do whatever it is they're going to do, it's not nearly as bad as when they keep digging the hole deeper and deeper. So don't be afraid of silence. Um, if you find yourself in a hole, the first thing to do is stop digging. Uh, biggest troublemaker you'll ever have to deal with watches you from the mirror every morning. Uh, remember that you probably caused the biggest problems in your life. Uh, take responsibility for that. Uh, and, and do what you can to improve the situation. Uh, good judgment comes from experience, and a lot of that comes from bad judgment. Uh, you're going to make mistakes. It's okay to make mistakes, but respond appropriately when you make mistakes. Make sure you learn the lesson you should learn when those mistakes. When you're talking about keeping secrets, 
Remember that letting the cat out of the bag is a whole lot easier than putting it back in. Uh, do not release secrets uh, before you know that it's going to be okay to release it. Um, and this last one I think is always a good one to remember to keep us humble. If you get to thinking you're a person of some influence, try ordering somebody else's dog around. They just won't respond, will they? Uh, so that, that'll keep you, uh, or should keep you humble. Um, again, I want to congratulate you on taking this class. Uh, for both the veterinarians and the chiropractors, it is a uh, strong show of your commitment to be uh, well-educated and trained to provide the best possible care for your clients and your patients. Uh, I hope that all of you have a very successful career. Uh, if you see anything that needs to be corrected on these slides or videos, or if you have any questions about anything that may not be as clear as I should have made it, uh, please feel free to let me know. You can contact me at this address here in Plano, which is my law office, uh, or you, you can contact me uh, by email at jgreen at jessegreen.us. Uh, just a quick word, there's actually a jessegreen.com that has nothing to do with me. So be sure you use the jessegreen.us extension. Uh, I hope you've uh, found this to be helpful information. Uh, and I, I wish you the best of luck with your career and with the remainder of this class.